Okay, let me, let me bring you back together. Hopefully you can continue those conversations after the service uh, a little bit more. Well, good morning again. It's good to see you. Happy Mother's Day to the mothers, to the women in the room. We are grateful for you, for your hard work, sacrifice, your love, all that you bring um, to us. My, in our family WhatsApp group this morning, my brother put to all the mums, thank you for all that you do. Um, we would probably all be very lost without you, which is, which is very true, isn't it? Um, no, he's being serious there. That wasn't just like we would be totally lost. So um, we're going to be looking, continuing to look at the churches in Revelation. We're on the penultimate one, the sixth of seven churches. And um, this has been quite a challenging series, I think, in terms of what Jesus has to say to his people and how we should live and how we can please him. And so if you have your Bible, would you open it up to Revelation chapter 3? We're going to be reading to the church in Philadelphia, not the one in America, the one uh, there in Asia Minor in Turkey. And it's, um, it's a little bit different in some ways to some of the other churches, and you'll see why in a moment. So it's Revelation chapter 3, starting at verse 7. It says this, To the angel of the church in Philadelphia write, These are the words of him who is holy and true, who holds the key of David. What he opens, no one can shut, and what he shuts, no one can open. I know your deeds. I see I have placed before you an open door that no one can shut. I know that you have little strength, yet you have kept my word and have not denied my name. I will make those who are of the synagogue of Satan, who claim to be Jews, though they are not, but are liars, I will make them come and fall down at your feet and acknowledge that you, I have loved you, since you have kept my command to endure patiently. I will also keep you from the hour of trial that is going to come on the whole world to test the inhabitants of the earth. I am coming soon. Hold on to what you have so that no one will take your crown. The one who is victorious, I will make a pillar in the temple of my God. Never again will they leave it. I will write on them the name of my God and the name of the city of my God, the new Jerusalem, which is coming down out of heaven from my God. And I will also write on them my new name. Whoever has ears, let them hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Lord, I do pray that this morning you would open our ears, that we might hear what you're saying by your Spirit, that we would respond in faith, that we might be the kind of church that pleases you. Help us, Lord. We pray this morning in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. I, I wonder if you've ever thought about what would make up the perfect church. What would be the perfect church? Um, I, I mean, maybe you've had this kind of idea of when you think of coming to church or being part of church, I wish it was more like this or I wish it was more like that. You might say, well, a perfect church would have brilliant teaching from the Bible uh, a perfect church might have great music and worship times. A perfect church would have brilliant kids' work uh, or a strong evangelism program or maybe baptizing people every week or the best tea and coffee. Um, or a perfect church would have a prayer team that sees miracles every week. Or it would be a church overflowing with loads of money, um, just resourced to do whatever they want. Or maybe it's a, a church that sees people set free of addictions regularly. It's a church that forgives one another quickly. And all of that stuff is good. But spiritually speaking, and in this present age, it is of course impossible to have a perfect church because there are no perfect people. There are no perfect pastors. There are no perfect small groups. There's no perfect kids' ministry. There's no perfect people. And so we can't have any perfect, in that sense, church. You may know that old idea that even if you found the perfect church, it would cease to be perfect the moment you join it, which is true, isn't it? Because none of us is perfect. So then, it is quite astonishing that when Jesus, who's the author of these letters, to the churches, when he writes to the church there in Philadelphia, which, by the way, is only 30 miles south of the church in Sardis that Rich spoke to us about a few weeks ago, which was known, had this reputation of being alive, but actually Jesus says you're dead. 
So that church there, which has been pretty harshly critiqued by Jesus, it's pretty astonishing that even though there are no perfect churches, Jesus doesn't appear to give any particular correction or advice to this church in terms of what they need to be doing instead of what they were doing. That's pretty amazing when you think about it. He has only positive encouragement and praise for them. Were they a perfect church? No. So this, for starters, should encourage us this morning that even though in our fallenness, in our brokenness, in our sin even, at times where we, we don't miss hit the mark, actually, it is still possible in some way to be pleasing to God. That should encourage us um, as we begin. Are we, when we think about it in, in the categories that we've been looking at through this, are we in this category? Would Jesus give us a letter without any corrective advice or any correction uh, at the heart of it? Uh, I'd love to think that. Obviously, the Lord knows our heart. I can't see that. He knows our heart. But what I do see in this is he gives at least five things, five insights Jesus gives to this church that give us a little clue into how we're to see him and how we should think and act. So I just want to walk through that with you this morning. The first thing is this, that Jesus reveals who he is to the church. He reveals who he is to the church. It says in verse 7, these are the words of him who is holy. Holy. I think it's interesting that Jesus chooses to reveal himself in that way to the church in Philadelphia, that he is holy. Holy means to be different, to be set apart, um, to be totally pure and true and good. And this is obviously through the Old Testament, Jesus is referred to as the Holy One of Israel. And here he is claiming that title for the Philadelphians. He's saying to them, I am holy. And for you and I, holiness is the ultimate goal of the Christian life. It's a process of becoming more like Christ. It's the function of the church to be, make disciples that look more like Jesus. And so he says, look, I am holy. That's who's speaking to you right now. But he doesn't end there. Then he says, I am true, holy and true. And true is obviously in the fact that he's not a liar. He's not someone who is uh, telling any fibs, but it's more the case that he's actually someone who is genuine and authentic. He is exactly who he says he is and who we knew him to be in all that he revealed himself in those three and a half years as he uh, conducted ministry on earth. So this is a pretty high standard. Jesus is saying, I am holy. There's nothing wrong or sinful or, or, or um, untrue about me. And so it's even more astonishing, I think, that still he gives this church so much encouragement and praise. And then he says this interesting phrase, I'm the one who holds the key of David. What he opens, no one can shut, and what he shuts, no one can open. Some of you may know that know your Bibles well, that this is really a reference to the Old Testament, Isaiah 22, talking about Eliakim. Eliakim had been given the keys to the kingdom, if you like, the keys to David's throne. Just reading from Isaiah chapter 22, just so you get the context, uh, verse 20 to 22 says this, in that day I will summon my servant Eliakim, son of Hilkah. I will clothe him with your robe. This is talking about taking um, the authority from one person and giving it to Eliakim. I will clothe him with your robe and fasten your sash around him in your hand and hand your authority over to him. He will be a father to those who live in Jerusalem, Jerusalem and to the people of Judah. I will place on his shoulder, here's the key phrase, the key to the house of David. What he opens, no one can shut, and what he shuts, no one can open. What he's saying is that Eliakim had unique authority for a time and a season to David's throne. Who would have access to David's throne? And what Jesus is saying by referencing that is saying, I don't just have the keys for a moment. I have the keys for eternity. That what I open stays open and what I shut stays shut. Jesus is saying, I am, I am the one who has authority. And keys do give authority. Some of you know that I used to uh, work in prisons. And um, I didn't just work in the prison. I was a key holder 
in, in the prison. So you'd get these keys at the gate. They'd be attached to the belt just so no one could steal them. And then as you come to gates, you open the gate, and it's usually a double gate. You open a gate and the second gate. You lead whoever you've got the prisoners through, and then you lock them both behind you. As a key holder, you have authority. You have a certain power that whoever can walk in and out of those rooms is based on your decision to open and close doors. Now, that's a tiny amount of authority in comparison to what Jesus is saying here, but he's making the point that I hold the key of David. This throne, that eternal throne, is under my hand. So he says, I am holy, I am true, and I have ultimate authority. So that's the picture he wants us to see him as in this moment. And he wants the Philadelphians to see that. And it, it reminds me often, you know, when Jesus had died, he had risen again, and he had, he had been appearing to the disciples, and then he calls them all to himself at the side of the mountain before he ascends into heaven. And he says to the disciples, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. He's reaffirming that, I think, in this moment with this church. He's saying, I have all the authority. You need to trust me. And so that's the first, first thing. He reveals himself to this church. But the second thing he does is Jesus opens doors for this church. What does he say in verse 8? He says, I know your deeds. See, I have placed before you an open door that no one can shut. I've placed before you an open door. I, I think this church is kind of interesting, uh, where it was located there in Asia Minor. Um, in fact, some have said that it was the access point to a region in the mountains there. So they were sort of the gateway, a doorway. If you wanted to go through the mountains, you had to go through this place. But actually, what I think this is really referring to, having looked into it a little bit, is that many of the Philadelphians and the early Christians, you've got to remember, early Christianity was really more of a sect of Judaism than it was anything else. And for them, when they would end up trying to go to the synagogue as these people who are following the, the resurrected Messiah, it's very likely that these men and women would have had a literal door shut in their face because they were considered blasphemers. They were considered people who had lost the way. They weren't following the true Abrahamic way. They had lost that way. And that's interesting because many of them would have experienced rejection, would have experienced hurt. You know, if you've grown up in this, this way your whole life and then you start following the resurrected Messiah and because of it, you lose your connection to your family. You lose the connection to the community. It would have affected actually the whole of their lives, business, and everything. They would have literally had doors shut in their face. Maybe they would have knocked on the door of the synagogue, and they would have looked at them and said, no, 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 you can't come in here. And so the doors had been shut, and here's Jesus saying, well, I've placed an open door before you. I don't know if you've experienced that, whether someone's ever shut a door in your face but it's pretty rejecting, isn't it? Maybe you've gone door to door around this area. I know several people do. Sometimes when you're telling people the good news, a door might be shut in your face. I've experienced that in that context. I've experienced it in other contexts. In fact, on New Year's Eve, I was going to Iceland. This is not a particularly spiritual story. It's just a helpful analogy. But I was going to Iceland because they do the best frozen chicken balls, okay? If you want a Chinese, like, at home. Iceland's the place to go. And I knew that. And I was like, we're going to get them. But the time was running out. And I looked online, and the store was going to close at 4. And it was like 3.45. And I live about 12 minutes away. So I thought, I can probably make this. And so drove fairly quickly to the store. I parked my car. I ran. And I'm not joking. It was like five seconds too late. I arrived at the door. And the guy was just shutting the the electrodes. And you know, it's New Year's Eve. We were hosting like a little party thing. I wanted these chicken balls. He shut the door shut in my face. And I was like, ah, oh! and I got there. But it's like a movie. Do you know, like he, I was like running. And, um, and the guy saw me. He was looking dead in my eyes, locking the door. <laughs> I was like, I've, it just give me five, like 10 seconds. I know where they are. I can get them. He was like, no, sorry. And he just shut the door in my face, this guy. Way too much power for an Iceland worker, I thought. But <laughs> Um, there's nothing I could do. I had, a, I had a literal door shut in my face. 
And I sort of walked away feeling very sad. You know, I just traveled 15 minutes at pace to be rejected. So the door was shut in my face. I and mean, that's that thing of authority again, isn't it? Like, when a door is shut, you, you, you feel like, well, where do I go from here? What am I going to do? Here we see that Jesus is opening doors for this church. They're not opening doors for themselves. He's opening the door for them. And you know, if you've been rejected, and I know I'm looking around this room, there are people in this room who have been rejected, not just by Iceland, but by their families, by the people who they've grown up with, by the religious orders they grew up in, because they follow the name of Jesus. And if you're in that group, I want you to hear this word for you today, that Jesus opens doors for you as you remain faithful to him. He's the one who opens doors. I mean, how many of you know, you know, when Jesus opens a door, no one can shut that. And when Jesus closes a door, no one can open it. If you're spending your whole life opening doors for yourself, you're going to waste loads of energy trying to keep that door propped open. And the thing you're meant to be doing and walking through, you're not going to do very well. But if Jesus opens it, it's going to remain open. And so if you've been rejected, maybe you've been seen as a blasphemer, maybe you've been cast out. Jesus knows because he says at the beginning of that verse, I know your deeds. That should fill you with joy and terror in equal measure. <laughs> I know your deeds. He says that actually throughout these uh, letters to the churches. He says to the Philadelphians, you continue on despite rejection, despite shut doors. And don't worry, I'm opening a door of opportunity for you that no one can shut. He sees what we do. He sees our efforts. He sees our actions. He sees the hard work. Even if no one else sees it, Jesus sees. He's watching where no one else is. And clearly the Philadelphians are doing something good. Otherwise, Jesus would have said, I'm going to shut the doors. They're doing something good because he invites them on that basis to walk through that open door. What is the open door? We don't know entirely. There's lots of debate about it. But it's a doorway to him. I mean, he is the door. But also specific opportunities that that church had to fulfill, to preach the gospel, to, to reach out to those around them, to show Christian love. When Jesus opens a door, no one can shut it. But then the verse carries on, and this is the third thing. Not only does Jesus reveal himself or, and open a door, but he also knows the weakness of his church. He knows the weakness of his church. Verse Carrying on in verse 8, says, I know that you have little strength, yet you have kept my word and have not denied my name. Little strength there, I don't think that means uh, you have little spiritual strength. He's not saying that. Um, I think what he's saying is you have little worldly power and little worldly authority. Um, in fact, humanly speaking, they probably appear to be quite weak. That's what he's saying. I know that, Jesus says about you. I know that you, you feel and you appear to be weak. And maybe they were weak in numbers. Maybe this was quite a small church. Maybe they were weak in sort of worldly influence, you know, no celebrity or fame. Maybe they were weak even in their energy, their efforts. They were struggling, just battling. But I want to remind you that outward appearance counts for very little in the kingdom. Remember, Jesus told all these parables of stories of seeds and yeast that look like nothing and appear small and insignificant, but they have serious impact. A few weeks ago, we heard about the church in Sardis and how they had a reputation for being alive. They appeared alive, and yet in their heart they were dead. Well, we get the reverse here with Philadelphia. They have a reputation, it seems, of being uh, weak with little strength. But Jesus himself opens doors for them. Jesus himself is their strength. In fact, human weakness is the perfect condition for God's operation. So if you're here again this morning, you feel weak. You feel maybe you don't have strength. You don't feel strong in numbers. We don't necessarily feel that influential as a church, that is the exact gateway for God to be glorified. Paul really goes for this theological idea, doesn't he? 
uh, particularly in the book of Corinthians. 1 Corinthians 1, verses 26 and 27, he says this, Brothers and sisters, think of what you were when you were called. Not many of you were wise by human standards. Not many were influential. Not many were of noble birth. But God chose the foolish things of the world to shame the wise. God chose the weak things of the world to shame the strong. And he builds on this idea in his second letter to the Corinthians. In, in 2 Corinthians 12, verses 9 and 10, he says um, he's been wrestling a bit with Jesus about some of the things he's struggling with. And Jesus says this to him, my grace is sufficient for you for my power is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, Paul says, I will boast all the more gladly about my weaknesses so that Christ's power may rest on me. That is why for Christ's sake, I delight in weaknesses, in insults, in hardships, in persecutions, in difficulties. For when I am weak, then I am strong. He boasts in his weaknesses and he delights in them. Do you know, that's not a practice I see a lot of. I see people boasting in their strengths, and I think we live in a day and an age which is all about boasting about your strengths and your achievements and your accolades and your power and your ability and your gifts. Paul says, I boast, I delight in my weaknesses. I've, um, I've sort of been thinking whether I'd share this with you this morning, and I, I'm, I feel like I should, but the context is important. Some of you um, are aware that in our lives at the moment, we um, have a major need in our home for Aurora, our daughter, who's, who's got serious, profound disabilities. And we ha- are having to do huge amounts of renovation on our house, um, of which we can't afford. You know, I'll stand here in our weakness and say that. We can't afford it. And so we've asked people to pray with us. And incredibly, and just I just want to say thank you, because there's people in this room right now who have helped and contributed and shown love. You know, a few years ago, Ruksha and I stood here um, when Aurora was first diagnosed with her condition, and we shared that the reality is we need you. We need you as our church family to survive, basically, to keep going. And many of you have not just in lip service, but in love, in prayer, in financial support, in all kinds of ways stood with us. And I'm so, we are so humbled, so grateful. It's a fairly vulnerable position to be in. And so we've received from from you in amazing ways. Um, but we felt fairly, fairly weak, you know, in the, in the process of it. Anyway, we, we put that out at the beginning of January um, to, for people to pray. Incredibly, people have been giving money, um, some of which, uh, half of which I don't even know where it's come from. Um, and I know some of you in this room are, are answering our prayers practically. And, um, and so that had been happening. And then it really, that initial burst had sort of died down a little bit, as, as it would, momentum kind of slowed. And, and just at the beginning of this week, I was really starting to think, Lord, where is this going to come from? I'm never worried about money. I always trust the Lord for it. But I was curious. <laughs> Lord, where is it going to come from? And then to add to the weakness, I got injured playing football on Monday night. Um, and this is a really weird injury. Uh, but the ball hit my eyeball. For some reason, my eyelid didn't do its job. And the ball literally hit and scraped my eyeball. And I had my cornea basically had a massive abrasion across it. So I couldn't see for two days at the beginning of this week. Um, So I was in the eye casualty with eye drops and all of this kind of stuff. And it's very weird when you can't see. I had an eye mask on for two days. You can't really do much. I sort of just sat there with this eye mask on thinking, oh, yeah, I might watch some TV. No, I won't watch TV. I'll just sit there. And I I was like, what shall I do? Well, I, you know... Losing your sight is good for prayer. That's what I've learned. So on Tuesday evening, Ruxha and I were chatting, and I was like, Where, Lord, where's this money going to come from? Just, so we just prayed, Lord, would you please provide? We need you to provide it for this situation. Um, the next afternoon, I'd managed to get my eyesight back a little bit, and um, we're working. And suddenly an email comes into Ruxha and I from a contact of a contact, so someone we barely know who had heard about the need that we have. And they just were deeply moved by Aurora's story. Apparently, they'd met her once before. And they said, we were so moved. We just want to give 20,000 pounds for her work. And like, you know,
when we're weak. Um, thank you, Will. When we're weak, God is strong. He provides. You know, we were weak. We're weak in resources. I didn't even have my eyesight <laughs> for part of it. And God has provided. He's reminded us that he is faithful, that he will stand with us. Because I think weakness, human weakness, is an opportunity for God to show his strength. The question is, what's your faith like? What's your faith like? Do you practice that art? Do you practice that art of boasting and delighting in your weaknesses? And in many ways, you know, I love the story of church here because we're not um, especially glamorous or full of uh, strength or human brilliance. I think humanly speaking as a church, we're pretty weak. We don't have any great fame or celebrity or genius or power to speak of. You, if you know the church story, it's been pretty uh, humble in its uh, approach. And yet, and actually I think a lot of what's happening here could be missed or hidden. And yet, I believe, just as Paul says, Christ's power rests on us. God doesn't crush us in our weakness. It says in Isaiah, Isaiah 42, a bruised reed, <clears throat> he will not break. Thank you, Zandra. Um, a bruised reed, he will not break. And a smoldering wick, he will not snuff, snuff out. You know, Jesus, when you read Revelation, he's fierce, he's powerful, uh, dangerous even, scary. And so you could get the wrong image of this God. But he's delicate with his people. He's gentle, he's kind. Yes, he's holy and true and has all authority, but he's gentle towards us. To me, that's a God that's worth celebrating and getting behind and understanding a combination of a God of all power and yet of mercy. It's not because we're perfect. In fact, it's often because we're weak that God, God's power is seen. And he says to them, yet despite your weakness, this is Jesus talking to Philadelphians, you have done two things. You've kept my word, so you stick to the teachings of Christ and the Bible, and you have not denied my name. You have stood firm. There is so much pressure to deny the name. So much. It's so easy, maybe in your workplace, in your family. When situations and pressure mount, it's so easy to deny the name of Jesus, just not to mention who he is or what he's done. Standing firm, it seems, the Philadelphians knew how to do this. Even though they're weak, they stood firm on the name of Jesus. This is not the story of a perfect church. It's not even the story of a strong church. But it is the story of a church who have allowed the power of God to shine through them. Jesus reveals himself to this church. He opens doors. He knows their weakness. Here's the fourth one. Jesus protects his church. Verse 9, I will make those who are of the synagogue of Satan, who claim to be Jews, though they are not, but are liars, I will make them come and fall down at your feet and acknowledge that I have loved you since you have kept my command to endure patiently. I will also keep you from the hour of trial that is going to come on the whole world to test the inhabitants of the earth. This weird phrase, synagogue of Satan, he's not saying all Jews are part of, of this. He's saying that there's a particular group that seem to be under the power, the demonic power of Satan, and they're causing problems for Christians. They're false teachers, and they place restrictions that weren't meant to be there, and they persecute believers. And Jesus says, don't worry, I'm going to deal with them. I'm going to deal with them. Jesus is his, the protector of his church. I will deal with them. I will make them acknowledge that in the end, your allegiance to me was right. And we may have to face that, brothers and sisters. We may have to face that level of persecution and attack. And actually, I think the grammar is slightly wrong in the NIV, the way it's listed out. Um, it, it puts it like this. Um, I will make them come and fall down at your feet and acknowledge that I have loved you, full stop. 
I don't think there should be a full stop there. I think it should say, since you have kept my command to endure patiently. Because you've remained faithful to me, don't worry, I will vindicate you. And then a new idea. I will also keep you from the hour of trial that is going to come on the whole world to test the inhabitants of the earth. He's talking particularly, I think, there about the time of the Antichrist, when that time comes of testing and trial. The message translation puts it a little bit more clearly. I'll keep you safe in the time of testing that will be here soon. And over the earth, every man, woman, and child will be put to the test. Jesus says, I'm a fierce protector of my church, of my people, whatever we face, the synagogue of Satan or the times of trial that will come, whatever you face individually, I am your protector. I remain faithful to you as we remain faithful to him who protects. And here's the fifth one. Jesus promises a permanent home to his church. Verse 11, I am coming soon. Hold on to what you have so that no one will take your crown. The one who is victorious, I will make a pillar in the temple of my God. Never again will they leave it. I will write on them the name of my God and the name of the city of my God, the new Jerusalem, which is coming down out of heaven from my God. And I also write on them my new name. Whoever has ears, let them hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Jesus promises a few very serious things here. He promises he's coming again soon. He's coming soon. This is obviously a theme in Revelation, but we need to know this in our hearts. He's coming again. I know one thing. It's sooner today than it was yesterday. He's coming soon. And he says, hold on. Stand firm. You want to read through the Bible? You'll find these phrases. Hold on, stand firm, stay steady, hold fast, stay the course, be alert, keep watch, remain faithful, again and again and again, over and over and over again. That's what the Bible is encouraging us to do. Jesus wants us to hold on because times of testing are coming. It's going to be hard. But he promises he's coming. He invites us to hold on. And then he says, I'm going to make you a pillar in the eternal home. This church in Philadelphia, in fact, if you go there today, there are still pillars remaining there from their original structures that were there. It was actually susceptible to quite serious earthquakes in that region. And so when earthquakes came, people would just up and leave the region. It wouldn't be a permanent home for them. But pillars, by definition, are, are sort of sturdy um, parts of the architecture. They're not like furniture that you can just move around. And so when he says to them, you'll be a pillar. It's almost a promise of permanence. Do you see that? For a people who are used to having to move all the time because of earthquakes, he's saying to them, you're going to be a pillar in the temple of God. And so he promises them permanence, an everlasting permanence with him forever. That must have been hugely encouraging to a people who didn't feel like they had that here on earth. And then he says, and he promises to write the name of the Father, the name of the new city, Jerusalem, and Jesus' name onto them. Some sort of heavenly tattoo, I think. He's going to write across them. This is quite a promise. Why would he write on them? You write on something to say that's mine. I think that's what Jesus is doing. These people are mine. They're not going anywhere. They've suffered. They've had little strength. They've struggled, but they're mine. This is just a... I mean, I... When I read this, I am encouraged, the promises of God, the, the, the protection of God. He reveals who he is. He sees our deeds. He opens doors. He knows our weaknesses and provides power. He protects and he promises a permanent home. You know, we may not be a perfect church. I know we're not. But we can persevere in faithfulness to please, please the Lord. We can ask the Holy Spirit to help us to be faithful in deeds. We can ask him to be our strength amidst weaknesses and persecutions, our lack of resources when we feel frail. We can ask the Holy Spirit to take hold of us so that we would hold on to the promises that he has for us. I'd love to pray this morning that we might be that kind of church. Really, out of all the churches, this is the one that's probably uh, the sort of shining light. I'd love for us to, to be that. As, as God's people, that he would use us for his glory, that we might be commended by him when all is said and done. If any of that has encouraged, challenged, stirred you, then, then maybe there's lots going on in your life too. The Lord wants to do that in you. 
whatever's happening. And the prayer team, I'm sure, would love to pray with you after the service. So let's take a moment. Let's pray, and we're going to sing together our final song. Lord, I thank you that you are holy and true and hold all authority in your hands. We come to a God who is powerful and kind, who's full of fierce fire, but also delicate, gentle love. Lord, I, I, we don't know anyone like that. <laughs> So you are totally different and we look at you in awe and we long to be a church that pleases you. We long in our relationships with one another to honor you. We long to serve one another in a way that reflects who you are. We thank you, Lord, that you're the one who opens doors and shuts other doors. Lord, help us to walk through the doors you're opening for us and to avoid all the pitfalls. Lord, I pray that we might know in our weakness that you are strong. You are our powerful provider. You are the one who goes before us. That Lord, human appearance is nothing in the economy of the kingdom. And Lord, I pray for those here today who especially have experienced rejection for your name. For those who have experienced heartache for your name, for those who've experienced attack for your name, that, Lord, you would very clearly be their protector. They may know the comfort and the power of the Holy Spirit on them. Lord, we pray that you would be close to those who are particularly brokenhearted and struggling. And, Lord, we do ask that you would help us to hold on, to take hold of the promises that you have for us that we might be the ones who are in that number, who are victorious. We know that that's the case because of your grace, not because of our effort, but because of your grace. Lord, would you draw near to those who are in need today and help us to be faithful to you, to persevere, to keep on. Provide strength even if we're weak, we ask. Thank you that you love to do that. And be honored and glorified, Lord, we pray in our midst. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen.